similarly to the Anglo-American religious traditions of the 20th century, uh, the African-American religious practices also brought uh, much greater commercialization and, and uh, popularity to the music. Around the turn of the 20th century, a younger generation of African-Americans started composing simple gospel songs of praise. These gospel songs began penetrating and affecting the sermons of Baptist preachers, the choirs of the American Methodist churches, and various forms of folk music. Their impact was so widespread that by the 20s, um, these newly minted gospel songs, which were widely popular, impinged upon all aspects of Black religious music. So I, I worked up a little chart just to kind of show you the chronology of how this uh, came about. The camp meetings were first. The camp meetings led to spirituals, which inspired the newly minted gospel songs in the 20th century. Camp meetings where they where they wrote new spirituals, uh, which inspired new songs, new gospel songs, which were much more commercial in the 20th century. Of course, the camp meetings began around the year 1800. Unlike most spirituals, these gospel songs could be traced to a specific composer. While hymns were directed, of course, uh, towards a, a message towards God, the interesting part of this, of, of this new phenomenon is that the message of the gospel songs is often aimed at humankind. And these songs impacted a wide range of people, and they inspired, uh, importantly, an entire um, realm of new artists, what uh, the individuals known as the guitar evangelists, people who uh, oftentimes featured more of a blues style of performance uh, paired with a gospel message, like Blind Willie Johnson, uh, who's a great example of, of this style of singing and playing. Again, you can find an example of Blind Willie Johnson in your listening examples uh, categorized in your assignments for this week. In the 1930s, the gospel scene exploded even more, leading to greater activity and increased commercialization uh, within the religious music industry. One of the key movers and shakers during this time period would have to be the Reverend Thomas Dorsey, who started out as um, as a blues artist and a blues artist who had uh, lots of success. He would uh, have been categorized as a star within that genre, and he went by at that point uh, the the term uh, excuse me by the name Georgia Tom. He had uh, worked with Ma Rainey as the band leader for the very very successful again blues queen uh, from the twenties. Ma Rainey. He was paired up in a duet with a man named uh, Tampa Red. So you had Tampa Red and Georgia Tom working together. Again, very, very successful in blues music. But uh, he decided to devote his um, uh, career to gospel music. So he made a transition. He earned the title, the father of gospel music, as many people refer to him today. And he emerged as one of the most influential of the early gospel uh, performers, songwriter who not only wrote uh, amazing tunes, but encouraged other people, helped a lot of other people to uh, to be inspired to start up their own gospel music careers, and had great, great uh, impact in the choir movement, uh, singer and uh, soloist and choir movement of the 20th century as well. So he helped to organize uh, choirs and inspire them as well, and worked within the organizational aspects of gospel music, uh, as well as the performance, again, and compositional uh, portion of the field. Eventually, he inspired people like Sally Martin, Roberta Martin, Willie Mae Ford, and helped to revamp Chicago into the nodal point for commercialization of gospel music in the African American community. So Chicago came, became a very, very important place for gospel music. And right in the center of this, again, was the Reverend Thomas Dorsey.